That's nice. Yeah. Welcome back. Yeah, welcome back. It's been two weeks. Welcome back, everybody. Two weeks. Two weeks. Two Two long weeks. weeks. And in those two weeks, we've had episode 49 go up. And this is episode 50. Episode 50. We made it. Hell yeah. We made it to 50. (laughs) I know. (laughs) What are we going to do? I don't know. That it does seem like a, an achievement that yeah. was it was not guaranteed. It was far from guaranteed. There were no guarantees. There's <laughs> no guarantee there's going to be an episode 51. I know. Um, I know. But yeah, 50 episodes, that is an accomplishment. That's Good job. a lot of consistency. Good job. Right? Yeah. Isn't it? I'm, I'm congratulating you. Congratulations, Tyler. Oh, the congratulatory, congratulatory handshake. Yeah, I feel accomplished, but we're halfway to 100. That'd be neat. Yeah, we'll get there. That'd be real neat. We'll get there. Yeah, we're getting more listeners. I took a look at our statistics. Oh, yeah? Yeah, you know how I I I like to do that. I like to check in Now you have two places to check. I only ever check one. Just the podcast. Yeah. The the, YouTube, the audio podcast. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. YouTube hasn't taken off. No, that's true. That's true. And uh, <laughs> so go go to YouTube and watch a couple episodes. Um, if you get the chance to let the people here at work know that yeah. people are actually listening. Because <laughs> I think they're judging our performance based on the YouTube views. So if you can, <laughs> click it. Walk away. Go do something else, yeah. but let it play through. So um, I recently signed up for YouTube Premium because they had a, mm-hmm. a free trial for yeah. like three months. I was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to try that. That's how I got sucked in and never going back. I'm not, I'm not, go, going, I'm not back going back, back either. I, I'm not going back either. So it definitely it convinced me on day one. I was like, oh, yeah, this is better. But one thing that I like is it shows the viewership graph on oh. the videos. Is that a YouTube Premium thing or was that just added to I don't know. all the peasant I haven't accounts looked at too. that. Maybe the peasants get it, maybe not. I know with premium you do get some beta features as well. Okay. So you can you get some things on your phone that yeah. not a lot of people have. But you know what I'm talking about when you when you hover over the timeline, you'll get like a no a graph that shows this is where most viewers are watching. Hmm. Nope. Haven't noticed. So I'm definitely going to be watching that graph for our episodes just to see, you know. Where people are tuning out. Yeah. <laughs> what? They're pittering out. <clears throat> well, even on our, um, this is kind of on a different vein, same topic. I noticed that a lot of people are still listening to our very first episode. Oh, really? On art, creativity, and influence or whatever wow. it's titled. Yeah. And I haven't gone back to listen to it, but I wonder... If there is even a big change, or if, if yeah. we would go back and listen to that and be like, dude, that was so bad. I think so bad. that should be homework or for each of us. Let's go back and listen to it um, individually. And, and then strike next it episode, from the record no, if it's bad. Next episode, let's do let's, another one with the same title. No. Mm-hmm. Confused no, no, no. folks. But let's talk about what each of us thought, like the progression of it. Okay. I think that would be an interesting We should have done that for segment. episode 50. I know. But F- episode fifty snuck up on me yeah. because technically episode forty nine at the at this very moment is not uploaded yet. You know what else is going to sneak up on you? What this ad brought to you by Juicy <laughs> oh Filaments? Oh my god! Really? <laughs> this time of year reminds me of backyard cookouts with friends, family, and fireworks. My great aunt <laughs> Melperta used to spend hours in the kitchen baking the most perfect apple pies every Fourth of July. We weren't allowed in. She couldn't be bothered, for she was making the perfect pies. Then one year, she left a Marie calendar box on the kitchen counter, and we realized she'd spent several decades avoiding the family at every barbecue and lying to us. (laughs) Here at Juicy Filaments, we'll never lie to you or pass off some cheap filament as our own. Each artisanal spool of Juicy Filaments is forged by hand. Right here in our Juicy Filaments labs, the old-fashioned way, with love and honesty. When you're printing with Juicy Filaments... We're family. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's good. And <clears throat> totally fictional company. However, I am told that we've secured yeah. the domains yeah. for Juicy Filaments. Yeah. 
So uh, maybe in the future you'll see a fake website. I think that it's a totally real website that our photos are going to show up on at some point. I hope not. And they will really be famous. I hope not. Maybe we'll have to actually produce some experimental filament um, that we can run through our open material license printers wow. in the future. What if we actually really launched the most successful filament company to have ever existed on the face of the earth? With all through, the technology behind Juicy this Filaments? Yeah. It could happen. It could happen. And all the love behind Juicy Filaments? I know. Imagine the love that goes into baking an apple pie if just half that love makes it into a Juicy Filament. Wow. Anyway, I, Apple surprise. pie filament, that's a good one. Yeah? Yeah. Does it, should it flavored, smell like flavored, it or should it taste flavored like Flavored filaments, it? yeah. Yeah, flavored ABS. <laughs> Go ahead, take a bite out of it. Just don't, <laughs> don't swallow. Oh, speaking of that, ABS still scares a lot of folks. That is true, yeah. I, I had a meeting with a customer the other day that um, had only ever done hobby level printing, really liked PLA for prototyping. His concern with ABS was that it, um, the, and this is the first time I've actually heard this. He did a lot of post-processing um, for work. They make, um, let's call them like turbines and things like that. And they do some functional testing. Okay. Uh, but he also, <laughs> as a hobbyist, does like, uh, like movie style uh, props. Okay. Props. Yeah, so yeah, he's yeah. done a lot of, of finishing of parts. Yeah. In PLA. Yeah. They probably don't last very long. He told me that one of the things he doesn't like about the ABS he's used is that you get kind of some stringiness to it when you sand it. Like there's some stringy. Hmm. And I don't know. I've never experienced that. Um, but I wonder if you had. You've done some finishing of parts. Yeah, I don't he was know. He's very particular about that. I don't know if I have er ever experienced anything that I would describe as stringiness? I mean, sanding definitely creates a powder, a dusting. Well, see, that's what he said about PLA. It's more dusty, and the ABS, like, tears and strings out. The actual filament itself delaminates? Like, you're getting some hairiness to it. I don't know if that's mm. obviously not very scientific, but yeah, I'm somewhat not sure. descriptive. I'm not sure about that. Well... I'm not either, but he was not uh, opposed to trying our ABS or our ASA, so we sent him a yeah. benchmark, and hopefully that works out well. He hasn't functionally tested his PLA parts yeah. yet, um, so I'm hoping that we can at least get a win on the side of functionality. Uh, in terms of surface finishing, I'd imagine that stringiness with like a high build primer or an epoxy coat would go away anyhow. Yeah, I think so. ASA is probably a better starting point for anything that's going to be post-processed. Just getting back to my original point. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Um, the air quality yeah, of that... the F123 series is incredible. So the concerns that folks have about that they're kind of nil. And we have air study reports. I've mentioned this yeah. before, but if anybody wants access to those, we can send them out. So shoot us an email if you're interested. Yeah, I get that. It's the styrene that uh, I think scares people. Is it? In the ABS is that what it and is? the ASA. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. there you have it. Yeah. That's the S in, in ASA, right? Yeah. So you have it there. And <clears throat> yeah. Anyway, I just thought I'd hurry and bring that up. Speaking of filaments and hobbyist level stuff sure um getting away from that do you have any big news any news articles that caught your eye over the last couple weeks uh there were a few one came yesterday and that was the announcement by altair that they had acquired gen 3d did you hear about this <laughs> yeah about <laughs> three seconds ago <laughs> Uh, so Gen 3D is one of three companies that have been on my radar that do implicit modeling software. And the implicit modeling software we've talked about here and there over the past you now 50 episodes as an alternative to a traditional parametric CAD modeler. The implicit modelers essentially use math equations 
to create visual representations of surfaces, but in the background, they're not necessarily watertight 3D models um, while you're while you're actually doing the modeling. When it comes time to print something or manufacture something, it's converted over to a solid model. But during the time of modeling, it's all math based. And so you can create one, you can create very complex shapes very quickly within uh, an environment that is, uh, it's set up to be based on simulation results and like field simulation results and things like that. So if say you have <clears throat> your laptop here that generates a ton of heat, more heat than it should ever generate. You talking about my little <laughs> rocket ship here? Yeah, and it the the heat creates a, a field of uh, temperature differentiations, right? Creates a field. And if you wanted to create, say, a heat exchanger based on that field result, you could do that fairly easily with an implicit modeler, easier with an implicit modeler that could take in field results and then based, big geometry based on that. And then you could iterate on it very quickly. So what does this mean for <clears throat> the folks at home? This okay, acquisition. Yeah. Well, probably not a lot of people, not probably not a lot of listeners use the Altair suite of software. Uh, we have some experience with Altair uh, going back several years now. I had, uh, I've always liked Altair. You've used it. I've used it. Um, I've had great experiences with the company themselves. They always treated me nicely. Uh, at one point I went to the Altair partner summit in Dubai, which oh, was really awesome. <laughs> yeah. Very awesome. Okay. And thank you to, uh, the people here at go. They sent me and my wife out to Dubai. That's cool. Yeah. Very cool. So um, is that why you like them? <clears throat> it's part of it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but no, it is so a good product. It is a good product. They have kind of two tiers of products, just like the SolidWorks line. You have, uh, like an enterprise level product in HyperWorks and the whole suite of simulation tools there. And then you have a more, it, it's not a consumer level because it's, it's not a consumer product, but it's on the same level as say SolidWorks in their Inspire product line. And Which is? <laughs> Inspire has traditionally been a, a simulation driven design tool. Um, it is a parametric CAD tool, but uh, it, some pretty so robust. Could you, would you use this by itself as a standalone or do most users kind of already have like a SolidWorks or a traditional modeler and then use yeah. this as kind of a. Uh, honestly, you could you could treat it as a standalone tool. That's not how I used it. I think that the modeling tools available in SolidWorks were, you know, they're much more mature than the modeling tools inside Inspire. So I would my workflow involved designing, uh, doing some conceptual design and then some somewhat finalized design in SOLIDWORKS, then bringing it over to Inspire. I was using Inspire for topology optimization and then pulling it back into SOLIDWORKS and doing the detailed design. Uh, that's how I used it. And in the topology epi optimization episode, we talk more about that workflow. But anyway, Gen 3D, going back to Gen 3D, uh, implicit modelers are, are excellent tools for creating lattices and then simulation driven design. So things like generative heating, design that means different things to different people. Okay. Yeah. Well, when I see it, when I see something that's been designed this way, yeah, it's all the same thing to me. Yeah. How it got there is a little different, right? From company to company or brand to brand for but sure. Ultimately it looks the same. These are these <clears throat> skeletal type models where there's just material where the stresses occur. Yeah. Mostly. Yeah. Uh, if you're talking about generative design, the way I think about it, yep. And then topology optimization. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but like you said, they all, they all take different approaches and then those approaches do sort of result in differences. So for example, like in topology is, is another implicit modeler modeling tool. I don't think it has the most robust, uh, topology optimization hyper as like you're, that you're talking about more of like an Autodesk generative design tool. Um, another implicit modeling tool that's on my radar in addition to gen 3d and in topology is hyperganic. 
<laughs> Sounds like you're just making words up at this point. Uh, yeah. So don't blame me. <laughs> blame blame the maker, makers of the of the software. And those are implicit modeling is different than topology optimization. Let's just let's just leave it there. Like the, there are two different things. Implicit modeling more has to do with like the kernel of the software and kernels. How very important here kernels yeah kernels are important. Colonel, colonel sanders is my favorite colonel <laughs> no could go on sorry the kernel is like the underlying technology that these modelers are based on and so, some share kernels yeah so solidworks like you and i share the colonel sanders yeah yeah solidworks inventor uh like Creo. Yeah, I think Creo. They're all based on the parametric uh, kernel, parasolid kernel, parasolid kernel that is licensed from Siemens. So a lot of tools are based on that. Um, but implicit modelers are, it's a totally different style of kernel. Similar to like when we remember when we were talking about um, Dendrite? Yeah. And, and we got into the kernel mm -hmm. discussion yep. there. Do you remember that? Yep. Yeah, totally. This was after, was it rapid? Rapid last um, year. Last year. Yeah. I think this was right around that. So time. I don't know what episode that would have been, but probably about 25 episodes ago. <laughs> probably That's more. Yeah, more. That was a good discussion. Yeah. So anyway, I think it's a big pickup by Altair. Altair has made a name for themselves by acquiring a lot of different companies and technologies, improving on those and then incorporating them into the package. And I'm interested in seeing what they do with Gen 3D. I would like to see implicit modelers become more widely used. I still think that there are some workflow issues like going back and forth between CAD programs is a disincentive from using these modelers. And so if tools like in topology or Gen 3D can be integrated more into the parametric CAD tool, I think that that would boost adoption considerably. But like I said, they run on different kernels. So how do you do that effectively? Uh, that's a that's a technological challenge, I think. Neat. <clears throat> yeah, it's neat. You want to know the news that I want to talk about? Yes, I do. If you're ready to move on. I am ready. That is. Yep, I'm ready. Okay. <laughs> 3D printed ears. Oh, that are real. Real? Yes. They can hear? Okay, so this is a technology that we've known about for a little bit. I don't know if you remember going to a local university here a couple years ago, maybe three years ago, pre-pandemic. Okay. And there were quite a few students that were working on their own printers, and one of the students was working on this kind of like gelatinous printer that, that could have cells implanted into it. So basically this gelatinous structure would create the shape. Okay. And then the cells would then be grown within okay. that shape. Yep. Like a, the scaffold. Yes. We visited a university. Are you maybe, sure? Maybe you weren't there. I have no recollection of this. Wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> I know. Um, but over, let's see, last week there's been news that's kind of broken about the first successful implant of a 3D printed, um, that was my was stomach. That, that was my stomach. Yeah, guy? Uh, I forgot to eat this morning. <laughs> I've got a, a <laughs> an energy beverage over there. If that'll help. Um, anyway, a 20 year old woman um, who was born with kind of this misshapen right ear um, had this 3D printed ear implanted successfully. Uh, I don't know. Let's see, they announced it on, let's see, last Thursday. Um, but yeah, anyway, I've seen pictures of it. It looks yeah. like a real ear. <clears throat> now, um, is it? It's got some, it's not like a perfect representation of an ear. Yeah. But it's far better than, than what it was. It's a major improvement. I almost feel like you can see the layer lines in the ear. Really? In the implanted ear. Um, so... Walk me through the process of this. This is this is a printed scaffold, and then it's infiltrated with human stem cells. Yes. Is that what it is? Yeah. So the company who did it is called 3D Bio. Okay. And they actually uh, put out a press release. I haven't had the time to, to look into it, so I'm sorry I'm 
I'm not a journalist here. Yeah. I'm just spouting off. Neither news. one of us are, <laughs> are uh, certified or credentialed this is, this journalists. This is from the New York Times. Um, I must have. You do run out of credits yeah. uh, on the free stuff. Yeah. So I'm lucky I can even see this article. <laughs> I know. Um, but yeah, if you want to look into it, the, I want to give credit to at least the company that, that did the project. It was 3D Bio. And I think they've been doing this for a while. So if you're interested in any of that, yeah, um, look them up. Uh, there's <laughs> obviously some proprietary stuff that happened. So they're not going to talk about everything, but I think the basics of what happened. Um, for me, it's just exciting to see that these are successful enough at this point that that's amazing. We're going to try and throw them on, on somebody. That's What's amazing. Next F full organs, Ooh. lab grown organs, I believe is like lab grown food and lab grown organs. <laughs> My favorite topic. I know. A nice that, little, that episode nice little engineered ribeye when we went into when we had the episode on 3d printed food i mean we really went into the weeds of macro and micronutrients you you <laughs> went into the weeds uh, that was a fun i don't know episode. anything about that i think it is one of the more exciting uh aspects of printing for the next 10 to 15 years is what's the human impact of printing and uh, like you said, people die every day waiting for organ transplants. Yeah, I didn't say that on the air, but I think right. it's something like, um, Gall, what was you the said? Stat? Two dozens, two dozen, two dozen people die every day. But there's like, oh, like I think it was almost twenty thousand. Yeah, it was on like the wait an list. eighth of a million, <clears throat> something like that, on the wait list for for organs. So could this yeah. be a solution? It's a double edged sword, you know. I think uh, this is going to get me in hot water. Go on. Many, many people have problems and health conditions that are completely out of their control. 100%. Oh, I know many, where you're going Many with this. people have health problems that are within their control. And I feel like if there is an easy solution to fixing those, it's a disincentive from improving habits. So that's one thing I am concerned about is the more and more people are this has been going on for a long time. The already. more and more people face no consequences for bad decisions, like the more likely they're uh, liable to continue those. Yeah. And it, it will just get worse and worse. That being said, there's hundreds of thousands of people who are sick as with, without any fault of their own. And it really is tragic that people's lives are cut short in those situations. It's terrible. Yeah. So I can't imagine working for a company that is on that mission. It's got to be both extremely inspiring and motivating, but also very heavy because you're fighting a problem that you can't solve immediately. And it may take your whole career to see some improvement. That would be really heavy. So, and very hard to do. Kudos to the people who are working on projects like that. For sure. And like Uncle Ben <clears throat> said, with great power comes great responsibility. Yeah, that's true. That's so true. we'll see. Hey. We'll see what this ends up. Give uh, it give it to Stanley. I think Stanley is It was of, Uncle Ben, right? Yeah. Was that his name? Yeah. Um, this was before he came out with the rice product. The what? <laughs> before he came the king of rice. Yeah, I don't know about this. Uncle Ben's rice? Oh, my gosh. Come on. Wow. All right. Anyway, um, I want to get into one more topic. Okay. Before we move on. Okay. And finish out this episode. This one's kind of been a mosh podge. I know there's some more meat and things you want to dig into. But we haven't done YouTube of the day for a long time. That's true. I'm going to revisit one. Okay. And I actually have one this week. You do? Because I have been oh. binging a YouTube channel. Because you got YouTube premium. No, it's not that. Okay. But I'm excited to hear about okay, it. Okay, yeah, yeah. You want me to go first? Sure. Okay, I'll go first. Robert Maddox. If this sounds oh, familiar, yeah. this guy's the rocket man, the crazy <sighs> rocket man. 
If you watched his video, this is the old dude with a beard just flapping in the breeze, yeah. going like 50, 60 miles an hour on this little go kart that's got like a triple jet engine on it. Yeah. And he's just cooking on some old dry lake bed. Well, he popped up again on my <laughs> my uh, little recommended videos. Yeah. And I'm like, what's he up to now? So yeah. I had to click on it. He is on a skateboard on this one. Now, what I love about this dude, no helmet, right? Like, how, how old did you say? Did you say he was like 85 or something? I'm, like, he's I was making a joke. I said, how did this guy survive to the age 85? I don't <laughs> know how miracle. old he is, but the fact that he's still alive with what he does is astounding. He's, yeah, he's made it to uh, the old, the gray age. It, it, he's at a ripe age. We don't know what age he is, but it's ripe. It's very ripe. He does have a helmet on in his um, go-kart video, but in the skateboard video and then this other one that I saw where he's going full throttle, yeah. no helmet, no nothing, no cares, no worries, and <laughs> he's just cooking. Now, to make <laughs> matters worse, for all of our entertainments, he's videotaping this, and he's got like a selfie stick. Yeah. And he's holding it with one hand and yeah. driving with the other. It's wild. It's worth watching just like just for the pure joy that, that you can tell he's super happy. And I love the comments in I that video. Really. You can tell he just he does it to he, rile people up. No, in the comments, you see just the immense joy that he brings everyone who watches. Everyone who watches it thinks man, I, I hope I'm that happy someday. And like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yeah. he's, he's inspiring for sure. Yeah. What's his name? Robert Maddox. Robert Maddox. Yeah. All right. So just search crazy rocket man. And I'm sure it'll <laughs> pop up while you were explaining that in the back of my head, I was thinking, okay, how can I transition my YouTube of the week to the next topic? And I think I came up with a way of doing it. Okay. Okay. All so right, all right. my YouTube of the week is Harry Mack. And this is another one of those YouTubers that has 2 million subscribers, which I had never heard of, which just goes to show the immense audience for content. But I recently, I just discovered him this week. freestyle chemist? He is a- Like Walter White? He's a freestyle rapper. Okay. And so he'll do things like, <laughs> he'll go on the street or he'll go on to like a internet chat sites and say, hey, I want to do a freestyle for you. Give me- Give me a word. Give me three words. And then he freestyles. And it's not just like a 20 second freestyle. He'll go for like three or four minutes and loop through like it, say it's say the word is Snickers. He'll sit there and riff on that for like a full minute. Just loop through it. Enthusiastic, expialidocious <laughs> and thermometer. Thermometer? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, thermometer. Thermometer. Yeah. Okay, no, no, I got you. I got you. All right, let's do it. Every time I rhyme, it's about to get drastic. All these rappers fake, they be straight up made of plastic. Anytime I'm plugging in, I'm about to make it happen. Whenever I be spitting, I be so enthusiastic. Yeah. It's... I, I don't even know how it's possible. You know what? I don't know how it's possible or what's possible. How you're going to segue <clears throat> that back to 3D printing. Okay. I'm ready. Are you ready? Yeah. Wait, unless there's anything you, else here. This is this is super off topic. Op, op, off topic. Off topic. It is? It's a ways out there. Freestyle rapping. Yes. Okay. So one of the things that as you're watching these videos, he gets he gets the same reaction from everyone. People's minds shut down. They don't actually understand how he does it. The just the wordsmithing and the different perspectives that he looks at the same topic from all different directions and he does it at at the rate of words at the right? speed of sound at the speed of his mind and so you get this sense of he's operating on a different level and sure there's practice and there's ha habits and and things that go into it but definitely the mind his the guy's mind makes connections that the average mind doesn't and what we talked about uh, quite a bit on the last episode was Industry 4.0 and the emergence of machine learning, artificial intelligence, and its impact on the automation of jobs. 
getting back to our last episode. Getting back to the last episode. So you have this jump from industry 3.0, which was largely the automation of jobs through things like relays and computers and things like that, over into industry 4.0, which is marked as a jump in the communication and data uh, communication between machines and humans and processes, and also data processing. And this is the segue. This guy is able to see connections between different data points that the average person can't see. And that's what machine learning is. Machine learning is here's a data set, show us the connections that humans can't see. So that's the segue. This guy- Or that we can and we ignore. No, we can't because just the sheer volume of data is beyond what we could even comprehend. Like some of these AI data sets are like millions of lines, like pet petaflops worth of data. <laughs> How's that feel? Yeah, it feels good. I actually think a petaflop is a good night. is a bit rate, so that doesn't make sense to have petaflops of data, but you could be petaflops per I don't know. Look up petaflop. I think it's a data rate. I'm afraid of what might pop up here. P -E -T -A if I spell it wrong. F L O P petaflop. It's a unit of computing speed equal yeah. to 1000 million million floating point operations per second. Yeah. Whew. So, like quantum computers work on the scale of petaflops. And and I think the world's largest supercomputers Anyway, it's a lot of data. I'm so mad right way now. Way beyond, so mad way beyond the human's ability, and also just connections, connecting data points. I mean, they're so you're liking likening this man who connects points <clears throat> yeah. from different points of view. Yeah, that is to a, industry 4.0. That's a strong segue. That's a, it's a segue. Very robust. It's a very strong segue. But are we ready to go on to the next topic? It amazes me the things you're good at and the Harry things Mack. you're not. <laughs> yeah, Harry Mack. Wow. Harry Mack. Uh, trust me, you watch him. And the other thing I like about him is that he's always positive. Always positive. Rapper is rapping and uh, rap battles or a lot of it is like dissing each other and attacking each other. He's mm -hmm. always building people up. It's awesome. That's neat. Yeah. I like that. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll give it a watch. You should. Be prepared to watch at least 30 minutes of it. Really? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, so I want to talk about this a little bit more. You mentioned Surat. Yeah. Last week I did, right? How should we, like, how Last should I episode. pronounce that? Surat? I think it's Surat. 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 Oh, you're, you're doing the audible T? I think so. On the end? This is one of those words that, uh, I've read it a, more often than I've heard it. Yeah. So, I saw the other day on LinkedIn that they are going to like grow their employee count. Mm -hmm. This gets back to another old episode. Just the last like, episode. Was it? Well, the very last even episode. before last. Remember when we just came back from NorCal and we were oh, yeah, talking yeah, yeah. about our trips? Yeah. And I did a terrible job of um, really articulating what I meant by company oh, growth that's and right. you're like, it means when a company needs to you're make like, money you're like why like, would a no, company grow that. yeah exactly i was like when i listen back to it i'm like no wonder no wonder he thinks i'm an idiot um <laughs> i don't think that uh sure but what i really meant is why do companies not focus on growth but why do they put the focus on employee <laughs> count instead of revenue growth or something else. So I, I saw an article that said that Surat plans to, to grow their employee count by like 10x in the coming years. What does that even mean? And why? Like, what's the point? Well, getting back to the exact yeah. same question <clears throat> I asked before, but I just framed it up a little differently. Yeah. Do you know? I, I want to make a point real quick here. And, you know, 
part of our dis- a lot of our discussion last week was about the labor market yeah. and what happens to jobs as they become automated away. And I don't think that I still don't I know. Think I know that. you don't think I know you don't think that. Don't you dare say that. Not we were we house. were just talking about it, I know. and uh, Sorry. and we and we were talking about stocks and company valuations, and the two are related in ways that maybe is not employee grow like employee count and stonk value. Yeah, they are related. Uh, it goes back to what comes first, the chicken or the egg. It depends on how companies are incentivized. What in, what in, ah. what incentivizes companies? And since the 1980s, companies have Here largely lar- largely been incentivized uh, based on their the value that shareholders place. And shareholders are a different set of people than employees, right? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. in the 1980s, you had the financialization of companies, where it's basically they're beholden more to their shareholders, which are focused on uh, profit and losses and revenue and things, all of the quarterly earnings reports. Mm-hmm. And it changes the way companies behave because suddenly, instead of focusing on at, uh, variables like what's the employee satisfaction, what is the buying power of the average employee, What's the median wage? It w- became more and more geared towards, w- like, what's our EBITDA? What's our ROIC? Like, these acronyms that no one knows what they are, except for shareholders, right? So anyway, the, the, there are underlying connections between a lot of these topics that I think are not super apparent. So going back to this Sirat. Uh, announcement. I mean, it was basically a blog post by their CEO, James DeMuth. And he goes through and talks about how their goal is to 10x their employee count by 2025. So basically three years from now. They're at around 100 employees to 10x it. That puts them around 1,000 employees. Within our space, that would make them at the top uh, tier in terms of size. Because you have companies like Stratasys, I don't know. Do you know how many employees Stratasys has? No. You could probably look it up. DM is a large employee through their acquisitions. They probably have close to 1,000 employees now, especially after that X1 acquisition. Three systems, probably around 1,000 employees. So to to have 1,000 employees by 2025 puts them in the top tier in terms of industry size. And to your point, like that's not the normal stated growth goal, right? Normally you would, and we've seen this in the past three years, companies would come out and say, we're going to be a billion dollar company. We're going to be a hundred million dollar company. So it is a shift towards the worker. Why? I've been thinking about this. uh, Don't make no sense. For the past couple of days. And we don't know. Like we don't know. We don't know. This is your guess. <clears throat> but yeah, I think I've thought about it enough. I, I can share my this guess. This is your and I, hypothesis. This is my hypothesis. And I think it is sharp. I think it. I think it's sharp. Really? Yeah, I do. My, just my bef- book market. Okay. 2,000, just over 2,000 employees. Stratasys. For Stratasys, does? yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's larger than I thought. Um. But that's it. Stratasys is a multinational company. Yep. Yeah. So, and that could be counting. Uh, that could be counting MakerBot. Well, um, from earlier in the year. Yeah, it would. But it doesn't count like us. No. Pe- people in the yeah. in the distribution channel, uh, which more or less, a hundred percent of your time is dedicated towards Stratasys. Sure. More or less. Uh, but you wouldn't count that number. So. It's a, it's a large moving entity, but it's also multinational, and I think that's a big deal. So anyway. So you think it's sharp? I do think it's sharp. It changes Why? the narrative. Um, something that we've talked about over the past few episodes is the changing uh, dynamic of uh, 
access to capital. Sure. Um, over the past couple of years, there's been upwards of $10 trillion pumped into the economy through various methods. And that capital has been allocated to various companies. And a recurring theme is like, maybe that capital allocation wasn't the, the most reasonable, but you had excess capital, it has to go somewhere. And so companies, especially startup companies like Surat is, they could go out and, and hold rounds uh, asking for funding and they would find it. And they did that. Surat, Surat uh, is funded to the tune of like $80 million, something like that. <clears throat> but we know that's drying up, right? Like there's contraction in, in uh, venture funding and the valuations are coming down. We talked about it, I think, two episodes ago. It's not going to be a for sure thing. If you want money, you go find money, right? But another thing that we talked about on the last or two episodes ago was AM Forward and some government initiatives, both state and federal, to provide access to capital. Okay, so if you're going, if you're going to a venture firm and you say, "I want money," what what's the incentive for a venture firm to give you? Money. technology ip but what's the value in technology and ip real hard telling they're expecting a return right sure like if if they're going to give you money they yeah. want a return yeah that's that's what the ultimate goal is. they want fledgling technologies yeah so if you're trying to convince a venture firm to give you funding and to invest in your company you're going to communicate to them what their return will be and that's in dollars so that's why companies would say hey we're going to be a billion dollar company in four years because that's attractive to potential investors if you start speaking to federal government and state governments and you are positioning yourself for grants or mm. uh, you know special lending uh, access or whatever, if you're speaking to a government, what is a government interested in? People. People. And so I think that's why they shifted their focus is they are, they see what's coming and they know that they're still in startup phase and they've got some momentum that they need to keep, but they also have, I mean, they're, they don't have a product yet. Man. So they need to keep that, that they need to keep that going. But do you think I'm right? I, it makes sense from like a big picture point of view, but in terms of where the money goes, if you have 10x the employees, you got 10x the mouths to feed. It creates its own set of problems for sure. Uh, you know, well, you outgrow your britches. You know what I mean? Like you it, can't put the wagon before the horse. It's definitely hard to maintain a significant payroll if you don't have revenue, right? Yeah, and you're going to be playing catch up from day one. Yeah. The implication is if we are allowed to grow and if we're allowed to hire people and if we're incentivized to hire these people, the product will follow, the revenue will follow. So you're talking to a different group. You're speaking to a different group. Man, I, I would, you know, I'm no businessman myself. But I would be wary, I think, of any company that says, we're going to go from small company to mega company in three years, and we're going to be successful. That seems wildly impossible to me. Yeah. Um, because with more employees, you get more red tape. You bog everything down. I've worked for small companies. I've worked for big ones. And when you've got 50 employees or less man you're nimble you're lightweight and you can cook on ideas if you've got actual intellectual property that you want to develop you don't have to ask permission just get it done you mm -hmm. know and things are at an excel like progression in, in my opinion at, is at an accelerated rate just because of how nimble you are but you bog that down and it could just it could take years yeah. to get one little thing done that you could have gotten done in a month yeah before there there's a really good book on this topic uh, called loon shots and in this book they describe what incentivizes the employees of a small company 
versus what incentivizes the employees of a large company, and also how a company excels, whether they're large or small. And to, to put it in a nutshell, this is what the book says, and I think I agree with it, is that in a small company, uh, the incentive and the drive comes from innovation. And the employees all have, uh, you know, they're closer to the results. So every decision they make, it's the result of that is more visible. And so they're incentivized to make those good decisions. Larger companies, what drives them is perfection of process, not so much innovation, but process, become more efficient. And every individual employee has less impact. The decisions that they make have less impact and it's less visible on the end result. And within each organization, you have different personalities that will thrive in each one. And so the upshot is for a company to go from 100 to 1,000 very rapidly makes it, that's, that's, very, that's very difficult, very difficult to do. You're doing an entire shift like on culture, we could call it. Oh, you yeah. Know, there's a lot of talk about company culture, but you wash out whatever culture you had, good or bad. Yeah. You know, you could do it for good or for bad, yeah. for better or for worse. Just do a full washout of your culture because you're basically starting from scratch. But that being said, if you start, the company hasn't been around for a long time. I don't know the exact date, but it's a little over a year. I think we first talked about them at the begin or some sometime early in 2021. Anyway, they're fledgling enough that perhaps their culture was extreme growth from the day one. It's been that's it possible. Cre cre was created in 2015. Yeah, but I it wasn't known to the to the market. I'm sure. Yeah. Then, but so it grew out of Lawrence Livermore, and I wonder if that's when the research first started, or perhaps they incorporated. But that was. I would love to know their employee count between 2015 and 2021. Um, but you, do you understand what I'm saying? Like perhaps that shift from small to large isn't as much of a hurdle as if you start very quickly and say, our plan is to grow very quickly. But it's one thing to say it. It's another thing to actually to do it. I mean, humans can only adapt so quickly. And this, this was one of the, uh, points I was trying to make in the last episode where I was saying, yeah, jobs will come back, but when someone's automated out of a job, it takes time for one, a new job to be created. And then two, for a person to be trained on that job, that takes time. And we've seen that, um, all of the automaker jobs that, left Detroit and Flint and the whole Rust Belt in the mid 80s took decades to come back. This is well, this is an interesting topic, right? Because if we're just talking about the people in this room, and displacing roles in this room, you know, there's three of us right here. It's like musical chairs, right? Um, you take a chair away, we're fighting over two. It's very apparent. But in the grand scheme of things where there's like you're talking about it, like it's really cut and dry, like it's displaced like that. I'm talking like uh, you have a sand, an entire sandbox and you're pouring it on flat ground and there's one little dimple in the ground. The sand's going to fill that in. You're mm -hmm. never going to know or notice that it's there. That's how I think this like displacement of jobs and creation of new jobs is happening. It's the scale is enormous and there are so many situations happening in parallel that I think that the displacement of that job or um, that job going away is largely unnoticeable in my opinion. Yeah. It's obviously noticeable to the guy or gal who's unwilling to change roles. Um, they may have to go, if they want to continue doing exactly what they were doing, they may need to go find that job somewhere else that's still doing it that way. Um, but if they're willing to change and get trained 
and that sort of thing. Or maybe they hire someone new. I'm just saying this is all happening in like a constant state of motion. It's, it's not it, yeah. stop, start, stop, start. I agree. And it's it's very tough to nail down the actual numbers because you could look at like an assembly line worker that had a job and let's you're actually looking at large categories. You could say we have 15 million manufacturing workers in this decade or this year. And then the next decade or two decades now, we have 13 million. And then you would have to look at kind of associated jobs like data scientists and see how those numbers are growing. And you're trying to correlate the two to see if there's been growth overall. And then you have a growing population, but or in some cases you have a decreasing population. It's very complicated. Uh, I'll give you that. I'll give you that. It's very hard to measure. It's impossible to measure, but that, I guess that's why it's I fuzzy. likened it to it's the very sandbox. Fuzzy. Yeah. You can't keep track of every grain of sand, but it will fill in the gaps when you pour it in somewhere. Like, it's going to happen. So that's why, like, you're talking about, yeah, two million jobs maybe disappeared from this one segment of yeah. the economy. But those two million jobs likely went and were dispersed among others. So there's growth yeah, in other areas. Real. Think about like coding, for example. Mm -hmm. When we were in high school, coding was a thing. Obviously, it's been for a long time, but it, people weren't doing it casually. Now, I know people who just do it for fun on the side, and they're just trying to learn different coding languages. And uh, maybe this will turn into a job, maybe not, but I like to know how to do it. Yeah. Um, my, my family have some younger kids, and they're learning it in school. Yeah. You know what I mean? I think coding maybe is a good example of a job that exists right now. Um, and it's broad, like almost every or many, many, many organizations have no coding talent. And so someone who gets on Khan Academy and learns a little bit of coding could come into an organization and provide instant value. Right? Sure. But will that be true 10 or 20 years from now, where a lot of we have we have no code coding tools right now where you can essentially use human language, describe what you want, and there are tools that code in the background and do it. So a low level coding skill could be valuable now, but it won't be valuable forever. Sure. And it's also a skill that uh, can, can be outsourced. You know, there's no guarantee that a coder based in the US is going to be superior to a coder based in the Philippines, uh, Vietnam, or yeah, Southeast Asia, or wherever. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a problem, too, in terms of the whole conversation is, what are the policies that are encouraging some of these jobs to be exported? And do the same policies exist for hardware, right? Because like you have labor and you have capital, you have human operators and you have the machines that they're operating and you have policies that incentivize both of them to be exported tax policies and other, and other incentives. It's just cost at the end of the day policies. Mm -hmm. Well, policies is is part of cost. Taxes. I mean, you were gonna you you're gonna do everything you could to go here. No, I'm just saying, like we may have to take this into next episode. We're yeah. we're getting a little long on this. Are one. we already? Yeah, we're already what at the? 54 minutes. We did. Where did the, where the time go? I don't know. Too much fun. Oh my god. Too much fun. I do want to say that what's happened um, over the last 30 to 40 years. I think could largely have been avoided, but it's a much bigger problem like we were talking about. And individuals are acting on their own, on their own personal best interests. And there's nothing wrong with that, but they work within the, the scope of the, the playing field. Like they're on the same game board and the rules of the game 
dictate what's in your best interest. And it's important that the rules of the game have some sort of long-term vision that encourages everyone to work on their own best behalf because you'll never get humans to do that otherwise, but also gets you to a destination that's best for everyone. Does that make sense? Yeah, I guess to simplify it for myself and to maybe gather up my thoughts, I don't see, and this is not poking at Surat specifically or any other company, um, just hypothetical. We have a company that puts employee count ahead of revenue or ahead of technology or IP, whatever, uh, revenue. That seems backwards to me, even though I understand the incentives through policies and, and what have you. I just don't, it, to me, it seems like just a way to prolong the life of some idea. Um, Cause I'm sure the founders of Surat, for example, have an idea of length of time that they wanna be involved or you know, they have a vision for where they want the company to go, but they need a certain amount of time. And maybe this buys them that amount of time. Um, but ultimately, like, where do you want your technology to go? Do you want the company to yeah. stand the test of time? Um, I think employee count is so like secondary or tertiary. Like, I want to hire people as needed, not hire people way before they're needed. Yeah. What am I, I going to do with the 10x I the th employees I had before? Is, I think your main gripe with it is the 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 scale of it. If they came out and said we're going to double, it or doesn't we're make triple. sense from an investment standpoint. In my opinion, again, not an investor, but it, it to me it doesn't seem like I want to give my money to a company that has more employees than they know what to do with. Right, and that's my point. They're not speaking to an investor because the investors, uh, yeah, the investment's drying up. That's what I'm saying. It's I think it's a very astute move. I understand that it's you're saying they're gaming the system. I'm it's not a, saying they're gaming yes, the you system. Are. Yes, no. you are. Come on. I wouldn't. No, they're say not gaming it. Go it. on and they're say They're not gaming it, Tyler. the system. They're not it's, gaming the system. They're playing. Don't hate the player. Hate the game. That's what you're saying. Yeah, that is what Thank I'm saying. Thank you. Okay, so uh, so all what I'm trying to say is, how do these people expect to stay around for very long? Like they obviously have some technology, some inkling of of like hope, and maybe they're not trying to appeal to investors. But dang, but. The, As the founding, a customer or a consumer, yeah, how do they appeal? Well, the, as a, the as founders. As an employer, do you want to go work there? Not now, not there. The, yeah, not yeah, yeah. there as in Surat, but do you want to go work there as in the hypothetical company that's that's huge, has this little bit of technology, and they're trying to work on their processes, like you had stated before. Do you want to go work on perfecting a process or do you want to go work that's making a, shit happen? That's a personality thing. Is it? It is a personality thing. Wow. Some people, I guess if you want management opportunity and that sort of thing, like that is definitely appealing. Yeah. But there's also other things like job security, benefits, other, other um, advantages of working for a, a really large company. Oh, for um, sure. No doubt. So it's a, it's a personality thing. But I will say, Surat, they're founded by technologists. So I don't... They're brilliant. They're, and they're technologists. So I think that's important. Nuclear physicists, it's, right? Companies that are run by technologists are behave differently than companies that are run by accountants. And I think that the future, especially Industry 4.0, the people who run the company have to understand the technology. A, one of the biggest, hmm. an important factor of where we're at now and why we're at, why we're there again, is the financialization of companies and a focus on the accounting first and foremost and having, and having, uh, and we're talking about large multinational companies, like you name it. Um, we'll just say Chrysler, for example. Merry Christmas, yeah. Chrysler. Merry Chrysler. Chrysler has its very own special place in this whole uh, historical discussion. But uh, 
companies run by people who don't understand the underlying technology will never prosper from here forward. They just, they won't. You don't think? No, that's I don't your think hot so. take. I don't even know if we it's got, a hot take. That's a hot take. We got a hot take out of Tyler on the 50th episode. <laughs> All right. Yeah, 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 yeah. I can't believe we're out of time yet, but we can talk good. more about it next time. Um, on the next one, since this is kind of flowing towards the economy, mm-hmm. or it seems like there's a lot of discussion about economy, I am going to do something I don't think we've ever done, but I'm going to preface our next episode. Okay. Um, that way we can hold ourselves accountable to do a little bit yeah, of research. Yeah, yeah. But I want to talk to you about um, the economic impact of these crazy times that we've been through since like 2008. And you have a unique perspective on that since you've been in the industry for a long time. I just want to get your thoughts on where the it, the additive industry or 3D printing industry has basically where they've been, what they've been through uh, since you've been around and um, okay. what we can expect. You know, I think a lot of okay. people are kind of wondering what's going to happen in the next yeah. few years. We don't know. Yeah. But we're bracing. We can speculate. Yeah. I'm down with that. Cool. All right, cool. Episode 50. That's Good. a wrap. <laughs> <laughs> See you all later. See ya.